Perfect. Um, so I'm going to talk today about hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Um, I'm going to end the, the second half of the lecture with some original retrospective research that um, one of my colleagues really spearheaded um, uh, with guidance from some others, including myself. Um, I'm going to talk about what it means to need warmth to be at the target temperature for cooling. Um, and we'll get to that in the, at the end. In the beginning, I'm gonna talk more about just the review of the current standard of care, um, focusing on some of the diagnostic testing and the time periods we think are important. We are gonna start here with just what we know about energy failure after hypoxia in the central nervous system. Um, this article was published in 2006 in Pediatrics is one of the um, really seminal beginning articles that I turn to when I look to see what is it about the physiology of hypoxia and brain injury? What are the time periods? And it, this actually helped me start to understand why some of these time periods are important. Um, this obviously was uh, not human work. This is looking at energy. Um, and you can see that after a baseline of normal energy um, production and an induced hypoxic event, you have an immediate period of energy depletion there on the left. Then there's a, a resuscitation and a latent phase um, during which you are trying to prevent with hypothermia this secondary energy failure. Um, this slide shows it maybe in a bit more clarity uh, where you have this latent phase of the injury where there's still oxidative metabolism at the mitochondrial level. Um, you do though begin to have cytokine production uh, with intracytoplasmic apoptosis beginning um, in the secondary phase, which is like six to 15 hours. And that's where we get this notion that we really have to intervene early, not late. We, we're trying to intervene before six hours. Um, and you have this secondary phase of the injury. You end up with edema, uh, mitochondrial failure. Often this is when infants present with seizures um, and you get lots of excitotoxins, which are toxic as their name would imply. In the later phases, days three to seven, you end up with necrosis and apoptosis and eventual cell death without intervention. Um, why we thought this was important and what led to our hypothesis, which I'll present in a little bit, is that obviously the brain is crucial in controlling temperature. Um, infants have a, a large number of specialized processes to keep thermal stability in a challenging environment. I think adults take it for granted that they can be a, a fairly normal temperature across a wide range of temperature stresses. Um, where babies we know as neonatologists, as neonatal caregivers, are much more fragile to this event. Um, they are born with special brown fat to help uh, buffer this transition into an extrauterine world, but the CNS is ultimately the controller of this. So on the left side of this screen, you see a, uh, a snapshot of one of the pages in Poland and Fox uh, showing the interrelationship and the, the relationship between your skin temperature and your core temperature, telling your central nervous system hey, I'm cold, I'm hot, and you need to make adaptations um, for thermal stress that is cold. You end up with uh, heat production, you know, vasomotor changes, um, and behavioral changes for older people, right? Like our brains interpret this and say, hey, I'm cold, I need to go seek warmth, or I'm warm and I need to go seek uh, cold. Um, and so obviously the CNS is crucial in this uh, regulation mechanism. On the right here, I show work from recently, the Journal of Physiology in 2019. The study was done in West Africa, uh, where it compared babies who survived the discharge as compared to those who died after hypoxic ischemic injury and what their mean core temperature was. Um, the study was designed to show that the babies could be passively cooled. But what struck us was that if you look at the babies who died, they were their temperature instability was far more uh, dramatic in its presentation. And infants in the first 24 hours of life were far more cold. And this aligned with what we had seen clinically with our cooling programs. Uh, we have some pretty fancy blankets now uh, that track temperature and can report back temperature to us. We can get graphical displays of those temperatures. Uh, and so when we looked at them, it struck us that some of our babies who were cooled to 33 and a half degrees were actually kept warm by the blanket most of the time, meaning that the temperatures of the blanket were closer to 37 or 38 degrees. And we wondered if, did that mean that your brain was more injured than the cohort who did not? And this 
work from the journal of physiology would suggest that indeed babies who were ultimately going to survive um, in that clinical care context were going to have more stable temperature profiles throughout. So it brings it brought us to the would it be helpful as a diagnostic tool to know such a thing. Um, so I just want to review some of the, the standard diagnostic tests that we use to say a baby has hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or does not. Um, I think it's a crucial step in deciding who to apply the therapy that is cooling to um, and continues to be something that we struggle with as a community. I think some of the drive to do uh, mild HIE cooling work suggests that we often have experiences, unfortunately, where we don't necessarily think these diagnostic studies lined up. We may, maybe don't choose the therapy, but later we either have an MRI or a seizure that would support, hey, there really was hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy here. So these are the standard clinical tests we use. We've turned the enrollment criteria of the clinical trials into a series of screening biochemical and clinical criteria. We have the Sarnot exam, which actually is, is quite old in its uh, development, and uh, the research behind it is, is fairly limited. Uh, we have the amplitude integrated EEG, which is a more modern addition uh, to our diagnostic toolbox, um, and it has more research behind it, um, more clinical studies at least, as far as its diagnostic accuracy, which I won't cover in detail here, but they are there. We also know that the ch the, as the exam changes over time, that can portend a, a positive or a negative outcome. Um, the MRI, of course, we look to to show us injury. Um, and then, of course, we ultimately have a follow-up exam at two years of life. It's an interesting disease we treat because we have a, a series of screening criteria and diagnostic tests because we're asking the question, did this baby have HIE? But we have a delayed verification. Uh, we don't actually know until your two years of life. Um, and this is very unique. It's not like we draw a blood, we get a CBC thinking, are you infected? And then we draw a blood culture too. And in two days, we, we have a much more accurate test to the, to the negative, right? Or the positive, quite frankly. Um, whereas in this disease, we have to apply a treatment very early with still great uncertainty as to what the outcome might be or if indeed the brain was injured. Um, the Sarnot exam, just to mention a bit more about it, was developed in the 70s by Sarnot and Sarnot. Um, it has gone through iterations over time. This is a modified version that was used in the Neonatal Research Network trials. Um, it covers six different areas with some subcategories. All of them involve in some way either the central or autonomic nervous system um, or reflexes that are present below consciousness, quite frankly, um, as all of these are. Uh, and this is a standard. I think many of us are used to this. Um, we apply these criteria. Um, it is a difficult exam. I, there is um, some concern about intra and inter-related rate of reliability. Um, and having done this exam many, many times, having been you know, the CHOP local site PI for two of the NRN cooling trials, I can tell you that there's often a moment of, how do I interpret these physical exam findings? Some of the clinical trial work and some of the clinical centers have used the amplitude integrated EEG. I take this slide, I believe this is from one of Marian Thornton's works, um, and just shows you that even for the amplitude integrated EEG in the clinical trial work, there was two different normal abnormal classifications that were developed over time. Uh, you have a voltage criteria, which defined the normal lower margin of it of the amplitude integrated signal as greater than five microvolts, and uh, the upper margin greater than 10. Um, there should be a sleep-wake cycling that occurs, um, and it is considered continuous normal voltage in a pattern classification system. Um, what, where the two separated was um, in a pattern classification, this next one, this discontinuous normal voltage was considered still a normal finding for the clinical trials as compared to in the voltage criteria, it was considered moderately abnormal. And then you can see the others all the way down to flat or isoelectric. The bottom two are obviously the most severe and would align with the diagnostic testing that is um, severe encephalopathy, a flaccid, stuporous infant with very little movement. I will say, having also used the amplitude integrated EEG in some of the my uh, clinical experience previous to coming to CHOP at Jefferson, we were a cooling study um, center and continuation for the cool cap study, and I used the amplitude integrated EEG. And while these patterns look obvious, I can tell you that when you only have half an hour of the tracing, it, it maybe looks less obvious. This work comes out of the Neonatal Research Network trials and highlights 
a comparison of what is the value, the predictive value of early amplitude integrated EEG versus the neurologic examination. And you can see as far as sensitivities go, there's a range here from 0.78 to 0.97 to actually one for infants who were in the cool group. I'll highlight one particular bar here, just following on from the amplitude integrated EEG work, which is that um, infants who were less than six hours old who had an abnormal EEG, the sensitivity was 0.85. 85% of infants who had a, who ultimately had the primary outcome had an abnormal uh, EEG, um, but the sense specificity was poor and, and thus the positive predictive values aren't particularly great. And it started to it starts to speak to me to the, the need that it's not just one test we do, it's a series of tests. And most clinicians will tell you that they use these tests in combination with one another, not in isolation. Um, and it's difficult to counsel parents because we all, we have experiences anecdotally in either direction. Um, this, this work comes from, again from uh, the NRN work from, this is Sita, who is the primary author, Shankaran, um, and speaks to the evolution of the neurologic exam. So what you see here is a percent of children on the y-axis and on the x-axis you see their neurologic examinations. Um, uh, the dark black bars here are they were mild to no encephalopathy on exam up through the light gray, which were severe. And you see that there's a natural evolution over time. And we do know that, the in, that having a normal neurologic examination at discharge dramatically improves the likelihood that you will have a normal developmental follow-up exam. And so we use these all in combination to assess what is the likelihood? Like, what do we tell parents after two or three days? Is there anything else we could do to, to know that it's getting better, um, to, to better predict the two-year state. Um, just to review that we know cooling works, this was animal work by Alistair Gunn uh, that shows a per, as a percent of neur neuronal loss on the y-axis, looking at different areas of the brain section. Again, obviously, this is fetal sheep, like I mentioned. Um, hypothermia spared neuronal populations, um, and that was what led to the clinical work, which I highlight here with the, a forest plot from the um, Cochrane Review, where clearly there was a reduction in the primary outcome, death or disability in survivors uh, when you looked at infants with moderate encephalopathy or infants with severe encephalopathy with a more dramatic effect in those who are moderately encephalopathic. And I think we accept this for term infants. The conclusion of the Cochrane Review basically highlights this, that um, I'll skip to the bottom sentence, to prevent one death or major disability, as many as 10 infants or as few as few, few need, five need to be treated. And that's a dramatic therapy for us in neonatology. Um, there's not a lot of other therapies that line up with this. I, I attended a lecture once by Roger Soule from Vaughn speaking on behalf of Cochrane, highlighting that it is indeed one of the more effective therapies we have. Since then, obviously there's been further trial work. We did an optimizing pooling trial in the neonatal research network that was closed for futility. The control group actually had the lowest mortality. Um, there was the baby back trial out of Duke that was looking to, uh, collection of core blood and stem cell augmentation with infusion um, that has actually been closed to external sites, although do continue to be committed to the trial. There's the HEAL study looking at erythropoietin, where early trials of safety showed potential efficacy. Uh, there's the preemie hypothermia trial looking to target preterm infants um, that just finished enrollment last month. Um, and then there was the late hypothermia trial, which for me did not, didn't lead to a clinically significant finding. So turning to the work that we did here and Dr. Flibbit led, um, we took data from the Neonatal Research Network, uh, highlighting two particular trials I'll show in a minute. Um, this is still a work in progress, so I would just ask people to consider that um, the paper is being prepared now, although it has been presented at the Eastern SBR and the SBR. Uh, the hypothesis was that for infants with HIE treated with therapeutic hypothermia, blanket temperature associates with death or disability at 18 to 22 months. Um, as I stated earlier. The two trials were actually that the contributed most to the cohort were separated over quite some time. Um, and we just like to highlight some differences between the two enrolled populations. Um, most notably, the difference was between a death or disability rate of 44% in the initial trial induced hypothermia published in 2005 uh, and 29% in the optimizing cooling trial published um, in 2014 and 2017. Um, differences have been highlighted in this study. Um, there were some differences in the exam between the tone, um, moderate only hypotonia was included um, in the initial trial 
um, suck reflex to moderate was weak. So this highlights some differences between the Sarnon exam. Um, the initial trial did not allow pre-cooling and did also did not exclude for low temperature. The outcome there was the Bailey 2, where now it's the Bailey 3. Um, and there was some slight differences in the definition of severe disability. In the optimizing cooling trial, there was, the infants turned out to be less critically ill at randomization. This may re reflect an adoption of the therapy in the community and more easily refer referrals. Um, again, highlighted by fewer infants with severe HIE. Um, they were earlier to therapeutic hypothermia. There was less anticonvulsant use and less hypocarbia or hyperoxia, again, reflecting, I think, improved management of children in this cohort. Um, but there was more analgesia, I think, as people became sensitive to shivering and perceived pain. Um, the blanket temperatures we looked at here, this is how the NRN collected blanket temperatures. Um, there's a baseline temperature, and then there's, for the first four hours, every 15-minute temperatures. Um, for the next, for the hour four to five, it can be every 10 minutes or as needed. Um, for the next four, um, for the next 12 hours, it's Q hourly um, in hours four to five or 12. And then from hour 12 on, it's every four hours. Just to remind everybody how CETA defined uh, the phases of cooling, there's the initiation time to a equilibration at 33 and a half degrees. And then there's from equilibration through rewarming, which is called maintenance. So you have induction and maintenance. And on the right, you just see a sample temperature profile plotting both blanket temperature in black and cooling temperature in blue. This infant had a very uh, homogeneous run, if you will. The blanket starts out pretty cool. Um, for term infants, the initial cooling temperature used to be five degrees centigrade, or still is, um, although many clinical centers have altered that. Um, and then you see the uh, blanket temperature changes over time to maintain the infant in the normal therapeutic hypothermia range at 33 and a half degrees plus or minus. So the cohort that was uh, developed for this effort included induced hypothermia and optimizing cooling subjects, almost equal numbers of each, led to about 197 infants who had been cooled for 72 hours to 33 and a half degrees. Um, primary outcome was available for 194 of those with adequate data for another 187. Um, so there was data for the maintenance phase for 185 and through um, maintenance phase by 24 out to 24 hours for 187. Overall in the cohort, the rate of death or disability was 37%, which represents the rough arithmetic, arithmetic, arithmetic mean sorry, um, of the two populations I mentioned earlier. To describe how we, we dealt with the temperatures, we really dealt with them to, with two different methods. I'll show you the results for. <clears throat> um, one method was to look at all blanket temperatures uh, through the phases and then arrange them in a rank order from lowest to high, to break that into quartiles, and then take the mean of the first quartile, the overall median, and the mean of the highest quartile. So you can imagine that if I was a baby who needed a lot of thermal uh, regulation support. Say I was somebody who did need a lot of blanket temperatures at 38 degrees, 37 degrees. The mean of my highest quartile would be higher than if I needed to be cooled throughout most of my cooling period. Um, this was a difficult concept for me to grasp uh, the first few times through. Um, it's actually still not my preferred way to look at the outcome data here, but um, this will be in the paper. The second way was to look at evolving blanket temperatures during the maintenance phase um, and to basically look at the number of temperatures greater than 33 and a half degrees. Um, so whether the, the goal here is to see how many, how many temperatures and how many temperatures in a row did you have above 33 and a half degrees to maintain your temperature at 33 and a half degrees as an indication of consistent warming. If you needed to be consistently warmed above the target temperature to maintain the target temperature, that was an indication to us that you needed thermoregulation support and warmth to maintain a hypothermic temperature. The indication back all the way to beginning to the first slide is that obviously your CNS is not functioning in its normal regulatory manner. And without the thermal support, you'd be far less than 33 and a half degrees. The primary outcome for the analysis was death or moderate severe disability um, at 18 to 22 months. All, anal all the an analyses were adjusted for the SARNAS stage at enrollment, the center of enrollment as a random effect, um, maternal education, and trial of enrollment in case 
as we highlighted, there's differences between the illness severities, um, if that would impact the primary outcome. Odds ratios for the low, median, and high blanket temperature groups were generated for every half a degree centigrade above the target temperature of 33 and a half degrees. So here's the outcomes. And indeed, for every half a degree centigrade that the highest quartiles blanket temperature was above 33 and a half degrees, the odds ratio for death or disability was 1.58. And obviously that confidence interval would suggest the conclusion that it is significant. Um, for death alone, it was non-significant, but for moderate to, to, to severe disability, it was. Um, the other uh, groupings there were not as um, productive, although you see less predictive odds ratios or less strong odds ratios, um, and some are non-significant. Um, but indeed, it seemed that the, the primary hypothesis was supported by this data analysis for the highest blanket temperature, highest quartile blanket temperature. I think this presentation makes it slightly more obvious. Um, whether you look at for the first 24 hours or the first 48 hours, the table separated top and bottom. If you look at the preponderance of temperatures that are above um, the 33 and a half target, so if you look at zero to 50%, 50 to 74%, or 75 and above. You see that when you had 50 to 75% of your temperatures in the first 24 hours above 33 and a half degrees, again, the adjusted odds ratio was significant at 3.84. Similarly, for the zero to 48 hours, the same odds ratio, but here the odds ratio is up to 7.59, um, showing a significant impact of needing that, of having that many temperatures above the target temperature. If you look at what I prefer, which is the number of consecutive targeted uh, blanket temperatures above 33 and a half degrees. Um, if you had eight plus consecutive temperatures above 33 and a half degrees, whether that be in the first 24 hours or the first 48 hours cumulative, the adjusted odds ratio for death or disability was significantly elevated um, at 7.51 here in the bottom for the first 48 hours and 5.25. And I think this highlights that indeed, it seems to be a predictor of future state. Um, if you look at it most simply, the rate of death or disability increases with the greater number of consecutive blanket temperatures that are greater than 33 and a half degrees during therapeutic hypothermia. If you look at zero to three, you have about 20%, four to seven. But once you get to eight plus, almost half of the children um, have death or disability. Um, and I think that gives you the most simple way to, to visualize the data here. Um, this isn't the only times the temperatures and the temperature evaluations have been evaluated here. So temperatures have previously been investigated um, as esophageal temperatures out of range by Abbott Laptok in 2008 as a follow-up from the, the induced hypothermia trial. There's a, a trial recently published by um, a colleague in Seattle looking at, I believe it's Seattle, looking at um, blanket temperatures associated with MRI injury showed a similar significant finding in correlation. Um, we believe it offers another objective and simple measure that can be used in conjunction with some of the exam findings in EEG to help formulate a prognosis. I feel like most clinicians, again, getting back to what I say earlier, naturally intuit that we never look at only one lab test, or I would hope we wouldn't look at only one lab test in isolation, that we would indeed look at how they build as a preponderance. Um, I am a big uh, believer in that. I, I, I study probability some as well, and um, and a big believer in, in how we essentially Bayesian infer um, and Bayesian iterate, taking one probability and adding it to the next. And I think this is a very natural way for clinicians to think. We are gonna look at um, the diagnostic performance in isolation and combined with other tests in that vein, uh, looking at the diet, the sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive values, and how they might add um, as a likelihood ratio, say, pre-post-test um, to give you a different likelihood ratio um, post and how that might help us as neonatologists better inform our patients and better understand who an infant might be at two. Um, this cohort of infants continues to be one for me that is challenging and uh, is one where parents often are, are in a difficult position making difficult choice. And with that, I'll end. I think I've left about five minutes for some questions. Um, and again, thank you for the invitation and thank you for having me here and I uh, will see you tomorrow.